Go ahead, Nick. Kalispera says, um, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the third um, virtual public seminar brought to you by the Greek community of Melbourne. Um, and also a special warm, warm welcome um, to first time participants uh, in our seminar series. And uh, just to remind you all that the remaining of the program for the rest of the year, and the program will go until the end of October, we've extended it this year, uh, will be online every Thursday at 7 p.m. our standard time. Um, the new program has been um, put up on the website, so when you have a chance, uh, have a look at it. Um, and I'd also like to thank the sponsor of tonight's seminar, Joseph Salanidis, and invite you all to become sponsors of a seminar of your choice going forward. Um, just a reminder for those who have registered via Zoom, um, you can use the chat function to send in comments. I'll do my best to keep on top of them. Um, and towards the end, when we have the Q&A session, uh, if anyone's got questions, can submit them through the, um, the chat function. Okay, that's, I don't think there's anything else. Um, any other housekeeping items? Um, before we make a start, I just want to um, share my screen and start off with a slide. Of course, so tell me when the... Um, Is my slide visible? All good. Okay. Um, I'm just going to read the two statements above um, on the screen. Some people think football is a matter of life and death. I assure you it's much more serious than that. Uh, these comments are by Bill Shankly, um, the Reds, um, Liverpool's manager, the legendary Liverpool manager in the 1960s. The other comment Football is the most important of the least important things in life. Now, I don't know who originally stated this comment, but it's been quoted by many, more recently by the following managers, Arrigo Sarchi, Carlo Angelotti, and the premiership winning manager for Liverpool, Jurgen Klopp, most recently. Um, when you look at the above two statements, where do you feel you sit? It would be good to carry out a virtual poll now that all the seminars are online. Well, I very much lean towards the first one, Bill Shankly's words. Football clubs don't exist in isolation. Football clubs don't exist in a vacuum. Uh, football clubs are not overnight outfits, as many A-League clubs may, dare I add. Football clubs are tribal. They have a social history. People express their identity th through them. They express people's cultural and religious loyalties. And sometimes people's shifting identities are often expressed more directly through the people's game than any other arena. In many ways, the focus of tonight's uh, topic and speaker is a cross-cultural analysis of changing national and regional identities with respect to the Baalk football team during the interwar years. It's a unique study of the interplay between football, society, and politics. The bulk football team and its passionate fa fan base need no introduction from me. The refugee origins of not just bulk, but other Greek football teams uh, is well documented. For these teams and fans, football was a way of maintaining their identity, dealing with the trauma associated with their displaced status, but also being in solidarity with individuals of common origins uh, and challenges. Uh, but now let's focus and welcome tonight's speaker, Lukas Tsipsios, who's dialing in from Yanitsa in Greece. Uh, Luca, uh, good evening, Kalispera, bonsoir. Luca, Miguel, it's me, Nasejo, me, Mazimas. Xero, oti, oti, dinis, me, adialix, mesa, to the Gavictio. Είναι σαν να παίζεις σε γήπεδο με άδειες κερκίδες, όπως γίνεται τελευταία. Αλλά μην ανησυχείς, είναι αρκετοί που μας παρακολουθούν και με αγωνία περιμένουν α, να σε ακούσουν. Για αυτό το σεμινάριο γεννόταν στην αίθουσα της ελληνικής κοινότητας Μελβούρνης, σίγουρα θα ήταν πιο ζεστή η ατμόσφαιρα. Δεν λέω ότι θα είχαμε φωτοβολίδες, αλλά σίγουρα θα ήταν μια πιο ανθρώπινη πούμε, ανταπόκριση. Um, a bit of background uh, on our speaker, Lucas Tipsios, uh, tonight. 
uh, as I said before, he's online from Yenitsa, a city in northern Greece, in central Macedonia, in the department or regional unit of Nomos Belis. Something that I've only recently found out is that Yanitsa is situated seven kilometers from the ancient ruins of Bella. It has a population larger than Ed Edessa, which is the capital city and gets most of the publicity. Uh, often the largest city tends to be the capital. So apart from expounding on tonight's topic, I would also like the speaker to answer the following question. If one is in Northern Greece, outline three reasons why one should visit his hometown of Yenitsa and it can't be because it's COVID free. Um, although Lukas's origins are from Yenitsa, he's a child of migrant parents. He was born in Germany near Cologne, but grew up near Paris as his mother is French. Lucas is a historian and completed his undergraduate studies in Paris at the Pantheon uh, Sorbonne University. And later at the same institute, he completed his master's in history of international relations uh, with a thesis on Balk in the interwar years. Last year, he was a teaching fellow at the French Department of Columbia University. From his bulk research, two articles have been published in European research journals. In 2019, he also edited an anthology of French letters with uh, Guillaume Roubaud Quachy. His research interests are around the history of the post-Ottoman post world at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, and at the moment, um, he's aiming to do a PhD on the inspiration of the Greek liberal elite between the imperial dreams, in other words, Miguel there, and the construction of the nation state after the Asia Minor catastrophe. Uh, but enough for me, the floor, the floor to Luca, a big welcome for Luca. Luca, the microphone of the course. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. It's a great honor, a great pleasure to be uh, invited by the uh, glorious Greek community of uh, Melbourne and especially thank you Nick for the invitation. I really hope one day to be able to come for real uh, once this crisis is overcome. Uh, so I, I think that I have to uh, reply about uh, three reasons to come to visit um, Genitsa. Well, uh, obviously, the first is because uh, well, Pella is just nearby, uh, five minutes by car. And OK, it's the, the ancient capital of Alexander the Great and Philippos. So, well, it's a must. Uh, the second reason uh, it's closer to my, um, my fields is because uh, Yenitsa must, I would say, is the only city in Europe uh, founded by the Ottomans. Um, it was um, considered as a holy city for the Muslims, uh, the Ottomans, because um, it was founded at the end of the 14th century by Ghazi of Renos Bey. So it made uh, uh, its history very particular, uh, I would say, because uh, uh, until the, the 19th century, it was only... Um, with the Muslim inhabitants. So uh, this situation makes it very interesting, I would say. And, uh, and the third reason uh, is more uh, practical, I would say, uh, is because the, the food is uh, very cheap and very, very good. So well, uh, <laughs> these are the three main reasons. So now, uh, I'm going to um, to share my uh, PowerPoint, right? Um, um, so, Bizim Pauk, our Pauk in Turkish, uh, one of the first slogan of the team. Uh, it's very interesting by itself because it shows that the large part of the first Pauk Tzidis um, were um, Turkish speaking, right? So uh, it's a very interesting fa fact by itself to understand the complexity of the interwar Thessaloniki. And my aim by taking Pauk as a research 
um, object uh, was to reveal another side of the history of Thessaloniki, uh, neither, neither from below because of the lack of sources, nor from the top. Uh, none of, no one of my protagonists are great men worshipped by the Greek national narrative. Uh, however, by taking Pauk uh, as a research object, I wanted to understand how a football team or sports club could have been used in the interwar as a way of politicization and integration of uh, these large masses of refugees uh, in Thessaloniki. Um, but also through this team, I wanted to understand uh, the creation of new identities and cleavages that were appearing from the new configuration of Thessaloniki in the interwar, um, and that we can still feel, I would say. Uh, more generally, uh, the aim was to do a social history of the transition uh, from an empire to the nation state, of the Hellenization and the conquest of Thessaloniki, seen as a process that started in 1912, but that continued um, during all the interwar through and seen through sports and a particular group. And this particular group uh, uh, who were playing the who was playing the role of the intermediaries uh, was the, the founders of Pauk, the Constantinopolitans. Um, first, um, to see what led me to this subject, we need to understand the importance of uh, sports, of course, and especially football in the Greek uh, social life. Uh, this picture on the right uh, was from this uh, January, right, during, during the protests of, um, organized by Pauk. Um, so the, um, for many people, uh, it may be the most important social phenomenon uh, and one of the first identities that, uh, that one is willing to show right, in Greek life. Uh, it is frequently the first random question asked to someone you have just met. Uh, I remember when I was a child. Uh, in my city, uh, it is, uh, I would say, a rhetoric rhetorical uh, question because uh, the answer is uh, only Pauk, of course. Um, considering the amount of time and energy that so many people, uh, perhaps myself, are spending in stadium, cafe, propozidica, uh, considering the passion that uh, uh, is following uh, any news or institutional decision that concerns football, considering the political dimension of any football scandal in Greece that is always ready to make fall any government, considering also all the myths that are surrounding every team's history and especially Pauk's one, uh, I was always wondering why is there no academic research on Pauk and so few and anything that concerns modern sports in Greece. Uh, I, must, I must mention here some academic works. Um, for instance, uh, the, the one of uh, Christina uh, Kuluri uh, on the Greek bourgeoisie at the end of the 19th century in sports and education, or uh, Alexandros Kitroev that you may know on Panathinaikos, or more recently the PhD dissertation of Andreas Baltas on uh, the refugee teams in the interwar. But these are very few academic word, works, nothing that can be compared to what is done in England, France, or even Turkey. For instance. And it's mostly uh, inaudible, lost in the middle of thousands of daily articles, comments produced by the media or fans. So don't forget that only in Thessaloniki there are at least four main local radios that are broadcasting 24-7 on football and every, everybody is carefully listening to in these uh, hundreds of taxis of the city. So this should be at least uh, a main issue for a whole national research program on mass media and circulation of ideology through taxis and radio. But uh, I would assume that there is a kind of elitistic feeling in Greek academia that may uh, despise these subjects or at least consider them at, as not serious or not noble. I was particularly facing these attitudes when I was going to the archives, for instance. Why are you working on Pauk? It's not serious enough. So um, 
when I, apropos archives, when I came from uh, Paris uh, with this idea and working on the refugees in the interwar period, uh, I, I was telling for fun that I should work on PAOC and I finally did it. The only issue was, was that PAOC had no archives, right? Uh, I had to negotiate for six months in order to find that they didn't have any archives. Uh, so th this is why I started the uh, prospography um, in order to understand who were the founders of PAOC. Um, what I knew that was that PAOC meant uh, Panthesalonian Sports Club of the Constantinopolitans. Um, that's all. Um, and it had to do with the refugees. Um, I started first. Um, I started first from the archives of the associations to find names, addresses, professions, and then I used newspapers to find the paths of my protagonists that you see on pictures. Uh, then the, uh, the archives of the city council uh, where they re were really active lobby, the archives of Venizelos himself, uh, of the parliament, of the Greek National Bank, and the historical archives of the Hellenic refugees in Calamaria, etc. And all this was in order to understand who were these mysterious founders, right? Um, but uh, first of all, before continuing and before I present you uh, these uh, people, uh, I need to, uh, to put some elements of context. So two main, two main things to remember in the interwar period. Uh, especially in Thessaloniki, where it was very intense. First of all, the national schism uh, between the monarchists, uh, the royalists, uh, and the Venizelists um, that started during World War I. And uh, this national schism continued during the interwar. Uh, so the king uh, was considered as responsible for the failure of the Asia, Asia Minor campaign. So the catastrophe, people were saying it was because of him. So the refugees that came from Asia Minor were supporting Venizelos. Venizelos, uh, who was, uh, let's say, the leader of the, Ven the, the, the Venizelists uh, movements, right? Um, who was representing, let's say, a more uh, a liberal, uh, modernized uh, tendency of the Greek political life, uh, like a, a modern uh, nationalism uh, with a will of modernization, bourgeois modernization, they were saying, etc. And um, uh, le, um, the, the royalists uh, were more traditional political force in southern Greece. Um, etc. So, in the context of the Saloniki, we need always to remember this uh, continuation of the national schism be between these two uh, uh, opponents, um, political camps, but also the communists that were rising. So, that's, that was the fear always for both um, tendencies. And of course, the refugee crisis after 1922 at least uh, 117,000 refugees in Thessaloniki. So it was a complete transformation of the demography of the city uh, it, in a very poor condition. These uh, people were arriving and uh, had to be a host somewhere, uh, largely in uh, the, uh, the neighborhoods uh, around the, the center, uh, often, often in the mud. Uh, with the uh, oh, with hygiene uh, conditions that were very bad, and uh, it was creating a social enemy. I was saying because all the the um, the existing uh, structures, social structures, were trying to collapse, right? Uh, because of this new arrival. So the the main issue were, were hygiene issues, uh, resettlement issues political uh, integration of these people or not. The, the royalists were saying uh, not, we, we don't need these uh, refugees, right? 
uh, and the Venizelists were hoping to have a, a greater uh, power, I would say, uh, elective power, thanks to the refugees. So, PAOK is considered as a refugee team, founded by refugees, for the refugees and the poor people of Thessaloniki. Well, we need to clarify uh, first what, uh, what was the refugee according to the treaties, right? Uh, so we are talking about Asia Minor refugees from the Ottoman Empire, Empire, those who came, let's say, between 1914 and 1923-24, uh, with a climax in 1922 uh, and the defeat of the Greek army by the Kemalist forces uh, that retook Smyrna in September 1922. Those who came in 1923 and after were considered as exchanged exchanged by the Lausanne Convention between Greece and Turkey based on relig religious criteria. The Christian Orthodox from Turkey need to go to Greece and the Muslim from Greece to Turkey um, for a land for them. Uh, and, um, but there were some exceptions, Muslims from Thrace uh, and Greek Orthodox from Imbros, Tenedos and Istanbul, Constantinople. Those at least who were settled in Constantinople before 1918, the well-known Etabli. So why were some Constantinopolitans in Thessaloniki in 1922? That's the first question. And why were they founding an association, the Union of the Constantinopolitans, and then first sports club, Ike, in 1924, that split and created Park in 1926. So why were there these people here? In fact, they were the exception of the exception. The établi, those who had the right to stay in Constantinople, that fled in 1922, about 40,000, afraid of the Kemalists and afraid of the consequen consequences of their political actions in favor of the Greek expansionism during the French-British occupation of Istanbul between 1918 and 1923. We call them the absence, apontes, uh, the etablis that were, that were not there when the Lausanne Convention and Treaty were signed. Um, thus, they arrived deeply politicized, deeply connected with the Liberal Party of Venizelos, and they were not sharing the same reality uh, as, um, uh, as the other refugees that you can see in this picture, especially in Thessaloniki, because these refugees were waiting for resettlement for years in camps, uh, and uh, our Constantinopolitans uh, that I'm working on uh, that came from the upper middle class of Beirlu, they kept somehow their wealth and especially their social, cultural, symbolical, uh, political capitals, for instance. And it's very uh, interesting to mention that, that while the rest of the refugees uh, were in the mud of Calamaria, for instance, or other slums, the Constantinopolitan elite was looking for buying a mansion for their union, their association, uh, in order to be able to drink tea at 5.30 p.m. Um, or the, where they can gather and have a talk or whatever. However, however the, as they felt concerned for their political careers, uh, they felt also concerned for the social issue of the refugees in Thessaloniki. Indeed, the refugees needed a political representation for their interests, uh, for humanitarian help, resettlement, new lands, bureaucratic issues, etc. Those Constantinopolitans were considering themselves as, a, let's say, a natural elite uh, for the refugees. Uh, as they were already tied with the Venizelist movements, they could use the refugees for electoral purposes, let's say, and advancement in their careers. And at the same time, the Liberal Party needed to structure the vote of the refugees, especially in the context of the Red Fear from one side, the poor refugees, so they could easily go to the communist side. And as much as they were feared, uh, uh, as they feared the return of the king, right? Uh, the end of the Republic. Um, so some figures of the Constantinopolitans. Uh, at first, the, the Constantinopolitans tried to unify the refugees through a confederation of refugees association uh, that the union uh, would lead of the Constantinopolitans. Sports appeared as a major solution in order to cre create 
at the same time weak ties between uh, the this Constantinopolitan elite and the masses of refugees. Moreover, this solution uh, was uh, satisfying the liberal ideology. Uh, indeed, sports were a tool used by the Venezuelists in order to solve the uh, social needs, the social anomie of the refugees uh, of the refugee issue by a liberal way. Uh, it was thought to contain communism and drugs in the refugee districts. That's uh, one of the officials of PAOC who are saying uh, why sports were so important and why PAOC was doing uh, something good for the society, for the good society, let's say. Um, uh, so so uh, it um, dangers of uh, drug poisons do not appear, but also the biggest danger of our days, communism is neutralized by the world sportive brotherhood. Um, but at the same time, no further social commitment, right? No need of uh, welfare, state investment or whatever. Uh, liberal values, they thought, like discipline, self-control, a modern relation with time, hardworking, training, competition would spread naturally through sports. Uh, on the other hand, for the refugees, it would be, uh, and uh, for sure, uh, a way to integrate the Greek society. Uh, there would be a wider social recognition with the local players uh, of refugee neighborhoods becoming local heroes able to compete with non-refugees or even Athenians. Thus, uh, thus uh, Asia Minor refugees would be able to identify themselves in a club that could make them proud. Um, if there were sports tradition in Greek communities of the Ottoman Empire, uh, you can see the works of Andreas Baltas. Um, so the Constantinopolitans could transfer something that they knew into Greece. We have to understand uh, this focus on sports as a more global trend that we can observe everywhere in Europe during the interwar period, um, with uh, all over the major industrial cities, we could see crowded stadiums, especially in football matches. So crowds are dangerous <laughs> politically, but at the same time, politically interesting to invest in, especially if we keep in mind the ideology of sports, liberal values of the gentry, Olympic spirit, etc. Et um, and um, so the first uh, logo, of, but uh, at the same time, we must also link uh, the nation state and its values of militarization, for instance, with the sport, uh, the athletic activities. Uh, for instance, um, to the power players in 1930, Venizelos said, the young generation must, must absolutely have a healthy mind in a healthy body, regardless of the peaceful period that we have, because it cannot, it may not last, right? <laughs> um, so this liberal motivation of uh, modernization of Venizelos met the personal ambitions of the Constantinopolitans, and so did the founders of PAOK. They founded at the same time PAOK as a major team, but also smaller sport teams in every refugee district of Thessaloniki. For instance, uh, in Tumba, in Sinari, in Calamaria, in Katirli, Curi, Marathon Curi, Curi Apollon Calamarias, uh, Canaris, Sinari, etc. Uh, and uh, all these uh, smaller teams were linked to PAOK, which was a kind of receptacle for all the refugee actions in sports. Thus, PAOK was able to enforce its team by enrolling all the best players of, the, of these smaller teams, using also a network of scouts at playgrounds where young refugees were playing football in informal teams of refugees. Um, so uh, there was, um, so you can see some icons of this uh, mili military spirit of sports of the interwar. Um, wait, 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 ah, here. Uh, this, um, this social action of PAOK towards the refugees uh, was also the aim of PAOK existence. So here there is a letter of PAOK to, uh, to Venizelos, uh, where Petros Levadis, the president of PAOK, uh, wrote to Venizelos in order to receive public funds for building a new stadium. 
So it shows the connections with the government. He's asking for a 1 million drachma. The president of Pau claims that the club is also modernizing Thessaloniki by creating new infrastructures and providing healthy activities to the refugees. And this has to be linked with uh, the, the more general policy of Venizelos of bourgeois modernization. Uh, and uh, if Pau survived, it's also thanks to it because at the same time, 250 uh, refugee association in sports were created during the interwar period, but only Pau is still existing with some other smaller. Um, so uh, this uh, network of smaller teams uh, that Pau is uh, leading uh, was making Pau a Panthesalonian Pan team for all the refugees and not only the Constantinopolitans. Right? It was uh, concurring with uh, the ideological speeches of the Constantinopolitan elite of a common reality uh, of being a refugee although their social reality were quite different. Uh, they were recognized, the Constantinopolitans, uh, as uh, the elite of the refugees. And in fact, they were sharing not so much with the masses of refugee in the mud of Thessaloniki's periphery, if we consider that the main preoccupation of, uh, of them was to find a proper mention for the, the union. However, the constant ideological speeches of being a refugee through the newspapers, through Pauk, etc., was a way to way to overcome this gap between their both class reality. Uh, by this way, Pauk was a mean of identity making, an identity that was refugee from Asia Minor, for instance, more generally, and that was what made it Greek and even more Greek than the locals. Uh, in Thessaloniki's national schism political configuration, uh, being a refugee for the Venizelists was a proof of Greekness, whereas being a local or indigenous, as uh, it was often said, was usually referring to the Jews in Thessaloniki, in the context of Thessaloniki. In this perspective, we could consider this network of smaller teams um, uh, following the disposition of the new refugee districts as a process of, let's say, encirclement of the Saloniki's downtown, down, downtown, kept in large part, despite the fire of 1917, by the Jewish community. We had the Jewish community very strong in the, in the center and surrounding um, the refugee district. Uh, the Constantinopolitan elite, of course, uh, usually lived in the center of the Saloniki, given the fact that they never faced housing issues. Um, but this uh, sportive network that they created in the periphery was uh, sportively putting the whole city, let's say, metaphorically, under siege uh, of a refugee and Venizelist pressure. The center was more royalist, let's say. This phenomenon was perhaps represented by the choice of building Pauk Stadium in the heart of the city, uh, at Sidrivani Place, if you know. Uh, thus, every weekend, thousands of refugees were coming from the suburbs and were symboli symbolizing the penetration of uh, these new inhabitants into uh, uh, the environment of the established locals. Thanks to Pauk, uh, they took this right to enter the city. Uh, where they could generally not go. Uh, this uh, phenomenon must uh, be also linked um, to uh, the more general process of marginalization of the Jewish community of Thessaloniki in the Greek state, and especially after the great fire of 1917 that uh, destroyed uh, um, the center, um, a large part of the center. Uh, in a certain way, this community was the rest of the Ottoman past, whereas the Venizelist governments wanted to create a modern nation state uh, with Western models of centralization and citizenship. Opposed to uh, this process, most of the Jewish community was supporting by pragmatism the anti-Venizelist royalist side as a way to preserve their autonomy uh, that the modern nation state would narrow. Uh, 
uh, in the context of Thessaloniki, the Jews became the main opponent uh, uh, politically of the Venizelists during the interwar. Um, many of them were also communists. Right? Therefore, there was a political use uh, of a kind of traditional anti-Judaism uh, that could exist also uh, in the room, uh, Greek Orthodox communities in Asia Minor sometimes, it depends on the situation. Uh, so there was a use of this traditional anti-Judaism in uh, the, the configuration of the national schism that led the Venizelists of Thessaloniki to build close ties with the far-right anti-Semitic organization EEE, uh, but also to spread anti-Semitic propaganda through the main newspaper, uh, Macedonia, who, whose director was uh, Petros uh, Levandis. The president of PAUK. Uh, I showed his letter. In addition, uh, the liberal elite of the Venezuelist, uh, the Constantinopolitans also were part of this elite, uh, used the underground world of Bara, uh, the district of prostitution of the Magyars, the Daides, like Alkis Petsas, we have a picture of him. Uh, who was totally devoted to Venizelos. Uh, he had a big uh, picture of Venizelos in his uh, Café Neo. Uh, and Pauk, in a certain way, appeared to be in the middle of this Venizelist network of violence, let's say. There, were, there was a network that where the Venizelists could use, let's say, violence, and Pauk was one of these, let's say. Uh, the, the team was a kind of catalyst of this political violence that was transformed in sportive athletic violence due to the passionate nature of sports and especially football, which became massively popular. Uh, when the EEE was founded um, uh, in 1927, uh, the officials of power gave to the organization its uh, offices um, Many PAOK officials were directly linked with the EEE leaders, and especially uh, uh, Leonidas Yasonidis, for instance, who was a great figure of uh, the Liberal Party, uh, and uh, let's say a hero for the refugees, uh, because he did a lot of political things for the, in, for the refugees. Uh, but Leonidas Yasonidis was also, uh, uh, as a Minister of Welfare, an honorary president of PAOK, he was present at the inauguration of the EEE uh, new offices in 1931. And he had a speech together with the Venizelist mayor Van Vakas and the governor Ronatas. Uh, finally, PAOK Stadium uh, became uh, a meeting point for the EEE organization uh, um, activities. Uh, whether when they were going to attack either the unionists or the Jews or uh, organizing protests. Um, so uh, we need also to, uh, to link uh, sports with the famous Jewish pogrom of the Campbell district in 1931 that was linked to sports because the uh, reason of the attack by uh, the newspaper Macedonia and the EEE organization was because of, uh, um, uh, of uh, the presence of a uh, representative of the team Maccabi Thessaloniki, the Jewish team in Bulgaria uh, for the anniversary of Maccabi Sofia, where there were like nationalist events um, uh, in Bulgaria. Uh, where there were Ma Macedonian Bulgarian nationalists uh, claiming that um, Macedonia should be independent, etc. Uh, so the the Greek nationalist side um, said that the Jews from uh, Thessaloniki were in favor of this Bulgarian irredentism. So that's they started, let's say. Um, uh, regular uh, attacks in the newspapers and then uh, against the, the poor, uh, uh, the working class neighborhood of Campbell. Um, and um, so the liberal newspaper Macedon Macedonia called openly for violence 
and for an end on the interdiction of the team Maccabi. Uh, and this led to the attack uh, the, of the 30, uh, 23rd of June, 1931. Um, after that, the government took measures uh, uh, that the, commu the Jewish community was asking for months before. Uh, there was a trial against the EEE because there were some deaths, uh, a Greek um, Orthodox died, um, living in the neighborhood. But uh, neither the organization nor the, the Venezuelan supports were never, never really worried by justice. And right after these events, uh, Leonidas Yassonidis said at the parliament, some years ago, I was traveling in Western Macedonia. I could see everywhere seagulls and hammers. This year, in the same journey, everywhere uh, were dominating these three E, honorable and working men who created an organization in 1927 because communism devastates the country. Men full of patriotism and nationalism could not be characterized as criminals. What he, uh, that's what he said at the parliament. And neither him nor Levadis, president of PAOK and director of Macedonia, had to face any difficulty after that. Uh, in this context, sportive violence cannot be only due to barbarity or inherent pheno phenomenon of football. And uh, if we can admit a progressive autonomy of football institutions during the interwar, teams in the other on the other hand, were reflecting strong social and political uh, identities that were transformed in the carnivalesque frame of stadium. Thus, there can always be an interpretation for every event of violence that implies masses, especially in the configuration of the Saloniki in the interwar. Uh, here you can see that uh, at the form of Campbell district, uh, a new place was inaugurated and um, it was called Leonidas Yasonidis, uh, right? Um, -da -da -da. Oh, yeah. Um, so, in this uh, configuration of Thessaloniki, how can we not see the links between moments of harsh political tension between the factions, uh, even inside the Liberal Party? Uh, and, and, for instance, the antagonism between Pauk, Aris, and Heraclis, for instance. Um, or a moment uh, when uh, Venizelists were divided, we could observe an ethnicization of the political debates um, inside the Liberal Party, for instance, where Pauk officials were had positions. For instance, uh, a non-refugee uh, official of the Liberal Party, of the Venizelist Party, Konstadinos Aguilakis, wrote to Venizelos in 1929 that Petros Levadis, the president of PAOK and member of the parliament, um, entered the meeting of the Liberal Party shouting in Turkish, Muhajir istiyorum, I want a refugee candidate, while there were flyers in the city arguing that Aguilakis, so the non-refugee liberal uh, political man, uh, is going to be elected by the autochthonous and Jews only, and that refugees needed to unite and, uh, around another candidate. By this way, we can understand a part of the conflictual relation of Pauk representing this refugee tendency of Venizelism, which was contesting the domination of Aris in the refugee districts for, uh, of Western Thessaloniki, and pa Aris, which was at this time a Venizelist team, uh, found in 1914 and uh, dominating in the football championship of, of, uh, of uh, Greek Macedonia, but without any specific affiliation with the refugee identity in a more national possession led mostly by local Greeks, non-refugees. However, the relationship between the two clubs and the official became even worse after the Venizelist defeat at the election of 1932 and 1933. So in October 1934, the president of PAO, Kalpaktsoglu, uh, who was also a member of the parliament here, um, entered in the field during a PAO Aris game, complaining against the referee and threatening him physically. He eventually created a tradition, I would say, because he went armed in the stadium. Uh, on the other hand, Heraclis, 
uh, the, the other, the third uh, team of Thessaloniki, uh, was openly a monarchist, a royalist uh, team of the old uh, Thessalon Th uh, Thessalonikis. Uh, the antagonism between Pauk and the oldest team of the city, Heraclis, was clearer. Its president between 1920 and 1945 was Apostolos Cosmopoulos, member of the Popular Party, so the Royalist Party, and elected at the city council with the Royalist Mayor Nikolaos Manos. Uh, many of Pauk officials were also in the city council, and the club was linked with Kirkos and then Van Vakas, the Venizelist mayor after 1931, who promised to build a, Pauk, a stadium for Pauk that the other mayors didn't accept. This direct position for the control of the city council through sports had also to do with the sponsoring of the city uh, to the teams. In any case, this situation led to violent clashes that the directions uh, of the teams also wanted. In 1932, Theodor Ridis, a PAOK official, said to the press that for the victory of his team, he was ready to whip Heraclis without contesting the alleg allegation that he was followed by, by uh, um, uh, Magurophorus, Mahirovgaltas, and Dolophonus, so uh, uh, killers and bad guys. And uh, this kind of stance helped the Constantinopolitans to create a new type of figure in the, in the world of sports, the Paragodas defending the honor of his club, and uh, by this way, receiving the confidence of the fans, creating by this way an imagined community around the club and its supposed values. So the, this is a new concept in this area that is paragondismos. So by many aspects, Pauk was a part of a specific Venizelist network uh, as a tool for the political conquest of Thessaloniki, but it became a major element when it came about the construction of the stadium, that's my last point. Uh, as we can see in the, in the map, uh, I had a map somewhere here, uh, the heart uh, of the city in yellow here was the Jewish cemetery and was uh, empty. I mean, it was a cemetery. Uh, and uh, it was right in the center of Thessaloniki. And Ike Thessaloniki that became Pauk had uh, a field just next to uh, this cemetery. So uh, Pauk uh, tried to build a stadium just next to the cemetery. Uh, and, uh, but it was too tiny, the part that they had. So they had to grab some land from the Jewish cemetery, but a part of the Jewish cemetery that was the Donme cemetery, the Muslim Jews that converted in the 17th century. Uh, so uh, there was a huge clash at that period between a uh, huge tension between Pauk and the Jewish cemetery uh, and the Jewish community about these lands around the stadium uh, in order to build or not the stadium. And um, uh, one of the Pauk officials, uh, Zubulidis, remember uh, that um, he said, one day madness took me. I could not believe that Pauk was not going to have its stadium. I went with the Daides, so the, the guys from the district of Bara, and I took possession of the road and a part of the cemetery. The Jews were angry. He said, guys, it will not be possible. We need to build our stadium, I told them. Finally, we found a compromise and we took a corner. Then we started to work. The morning people were seeing us in the bank with the costumes. The evening we were working with pickaxe. Um, so you see here the use of the, uh, the underworld uh, of Bara and the Daides and the Cafenia in order to protect the club uh, in the moments of tension. Uh, so in this uh, network, of uh, use of violence. You can see that sometimes they were activating um, thanks to the different uh, connections that they, they had. Um, so, but this uh, issue with the stadium was uh, also at the same time a larger political issue because the Venizelist uh, governments wanted to use this huge empty uh, heart of the city uh, that was used for the Jewish cemetery. And even since 1917, uh, the plans of reconstruction of the Saloniki with the 
the uh, French architect Ernest Ebrard uh, had as a goal to uh, use this uh, place for uh, a big park and they, they build the modern university. So it was a part of the modern modernization trend of the city to use these empty, to grab these empty spaces. And uh, in a certain way, Park uh, did one step, let's say, of the Venezuelist plans of uh, westernizing and rationalizing um, the city. And um, here you can see some pictures of the of the of the Jewish cemetery in the in the center. And here there is the. Uh, the um, stadium of Park and the oldest part of the university. Um, here again, so in white here it's the the tombs of the cemetery. The the second stadium uh, is the stadium of Iraklis, just next to the stadium of Park. So it's easier to say hello uh, to the you know, to the opponents. And here you can see, uh, let's say. Uh, a bigger map that I, I draw. I try to. Well, I kept the, the French uh, stuff. Uh, um, sorry, uh, but you can see in um, violet the refugee districts. Uh, in uh, rose, uh, the um, Jewish districts. So you can see that there was um, uh, like an encirclement, and in the middle the big uh, Jewish cemetery and the stadium of Pauk just nearby. So to conclude, um, the case of Pauk and its Constantinopolitan founders in the interwar period helped us in a way to understand the social conditions of the massive arrival of the Asia Minor refugees. Moreover, it revealed the fundamental transformations uh, that it created on the political scale. Sports appeared as one of the answers for the social issue, issues of the refugee crisis, a crisis that in a urban context led to anomia out of control, sometimes in purpose, of any governmental policy. The constantinopolitan elite in Thessaloniki made the choice to invest the refugees, uh, refugee environment by the networks in order to find electoral support. Uh, and thus achieve the political goals in the nation state. The reinforcement of the Constantinopolitans reinforced also the club that quickly became massive. Uh, once it massified, Pauk became vector of the Venezuelist ideological speeches in order to catch a crucial refugee vote at, the, at a time in the 1930s when it was uh, easily toggling to communism. Hence, uh, was mobilized the social conditions of the refugees, and thus it became an identity cr criterion that established a cleavage in the city between the refugees and indigenous people. A cleavage that uh, uh, was transferred into sports fields between the refugees team and the indigenous teams. The issue of the newcomers uh, was to win their place in the city to be the new establishment. Uh, athletically, especially political, often resorting to use violence uh, in order to do so. Thus, in Thessaloniki interwar context, we may consider that there was an inversion of the classical Eliasian uh, configuration, that refugees became ideologically, let's say, established, while the locals were becoming politically outsiders in the interwar. These practices and these discourses that maintain cleavage in Thessaloniki created identification processes that may be still per uh, perceptible today, but their genesis can be traced to the interwar period. Pauk, in other words, uh, a refugee and Venezuelist team against the royalist and indigenous teams. Since then, another central cleavage has appeared. Uh, indeed, Pauk now also considers itself as the Macedonian team the cl club of the Northern Greeks, uh, athletically and politically marginalized by the state of Athens and its clubs, always considered as unjustly dominant and marginalizing it. Uh, perhaps my last word would be uh, self-criticism uh, of myself because 
uh, I wrote a very politicized history of Pauk, and we always have to keep in mind that uh, in football, of course, the things are uh, in sports in general, things are uh, more complicated, of course. Uh, uh, fa uh, football fans, emotion in sports are creating a carnivalist culture that is always exaggerating or exacerbating every social phenomenon. But however, these phenomena uh, were there and existed. Um, I think I'm, uh, you can see here now uh, where the Pauk Stadium was. Now there is the University of Thessaloniki. Uh, I think. Uh, um, I am on time, right? Um, uh, if you need a bit more, if you need a bit more time, you can continue. That's no problem. If you need a bit more well, time, I, I, I think I'm okay to to have a discussion, right? Okay, okay. Um, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, there's definitely a lot of um, new things um, um, I, I learned, and, and I'm sure most of the uh, audience that sort of uh, participated and followed us. Um, we've got a few questions. I'm just trying to sort of um, summarize them. Um, there was one question um, about the logo of Balk. I presume the double-headed eagle represents Byzantium, but why the, um, the black and white colors? I noticed uh, in, in central, uh, let's say Istanbul, Besiktas also has sort of similar colors. Is there like why? I mean, why the black and white colors and why does AK have black and yellow? Where did that come from? Yes, um, because uh, Aik Thessaloniki had um, the double-headed eagle and the yellow and black colors, right, of the Byzantine Empire. Uh, but there was a split in 1926 uh, when Pauk was uh, created, founded. Um, so for uh, until 1929, uh, in Thessaloniki, there was Aik Thessaloniki and Pauk two different teams. And in 1929, these two teams reunited and became the reunited Pauk. Um, but Pauk, uh, because of the colors of Ike and so, uh, was uh, black and white instead of yellow and black. Uh, and this black and white was explained as uh, black as the, the sign of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, how do you say? Um, where, uh, for the sign of the loss of the of the city and uh, of the disaster, and the white as the sign of the hope of a new uh, uh, a new generation, let's say, uh, a new new hope uh, for Hellenism, etc. Uh, but uh, if you see uh, the um, between 1926 and 1929. Uh, Pauk was not using the double-headed uh, eagle, but uh, the um, the um, tetraphylo trifili. Uh, <laughs> um, you can see that on the uh, uh, wait on this um, tuk -tuk -tuk. Uh, Pauk was using this logo uh, between 1926 and 1929. Uh, and then when they reunited, Pau caped its uh, black and white colors, but it changed to the Ike Thessaloniki's logo, uh, so the double-headed eagle. Um, it was also a, a, um, it was also a way to uh, to, um, to 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 show symbolically the deep link between. Pauk and the Constantinopolitans and, uh, of course, Constantinople uh, and the empire, right? Okay, um, we've got a few more questions that they're, they're, they're building up. Um, the question I have for Milias is, what was the position of the other political parties towards the refugees other than the uh, Benaziliki? Uh, from a class perspective, you can see that different aspects of the refugee population um, might appeal to the other political parties as well. Yes. Um, well, the Royalist Party, the Popular Party, um, uh, had, let's say, um, a, uh, in southern Greece, 
uh, the royalist party was had uh, supporters in the locals, right? The local Greeks. Uh, uh, for the royalist party. Uh, in northern Greece, um, so in southern Greece and in northern Greece, the Royalist Party was usually against the arrival of uh, the refugees. Um, in northern Greece, the Royalist Party was uh, had the support of the minorities, uh, the Slavic-speaking minority, uh, the Vlach minority, the, the Jewish minority, blah, blah, and the local uh greeks uh, that were not refugees that was the and they were st they, they were standing in favor of a, a a small greece that didn't need the new lands and the new uh populations so at the same time for the venizelists there was a, this this issue of the integration of the northern greece as new lands and the new uh, populations that were the refugees and the royalists were against this plan let's say this uh, so there were two kinds of uh, nationalism at this time and the third uh, political uh, actors um, were the communists um, that appeared at this time and um, um, the communist party had um, um, uh, with the 1930s uh, it became to be, uh, it became more massive in the refugee populations when they were disappointed, when the refugees became to be disappointed of the Venezuelan policies, especially after the treaty between Venezuelos and Kemal uh, on Inunu, uh, the friendship treaty. Um, so there was a, a part of the refugee population that uh, started to go to towards uh, to the to the communist party um and also because of this their social situation that was not solved by the venezuelist uh, governments um but the the communist party had a kind of um, a strange position i would say because until 1935 it was uh, um the communist party was uh, following the the directives of uh, the comintern so they were struggling in favor of uh, an autonomous uh, Macedonia. Um, so uh, this led to kind of, at the beginning at the kind of contradiction between the the will of the majority of the refugees, uh, which was against this uh, this uh, autonomy of uh, Macedonia, and uh, the Communist Party that was following uh, the Comintern. Um, but after 1935, when the, um, the Communist Party abandoned its position on Macedonia, um, uh, the refugee votes uh, in favor of the Communist Party were um, uh, much higher. Uh, I'd say. Um, thank, thank you, Luca. We've got a few more questions. One from Steve. Um, while the team started with um, people from uh, Constantinople, was there a power shift to East Thracians or Pontians towards the end of this period? And during this period, did any, let's say, locals, Dopki, jump from Heraklis, Aris to Pauk? Yes, um, I, I think that uh, the Constantinopolitan elitistic identity um, kind of disappeared uh, uh, during the war. I mean, uh, I see the war and the civil war as a main um, uh, shift, uh, to it totally changed uh, all the political configuration and also uh, some identities, uh, especially in Pauk. Uh, so if in the interwar period, Pauk was at least the head of Pauk was kind of uh, had this uh, Constantinopolitan elitism after the war, uh, the the Second World War and the uh, um, uh, World War and the, the Civil War, uh, it changed and it became much more a popular club. Let's say uh, the club of the masses. Uh, in the 60s, it became like the the even the the club of the of the Greek left at one point. Uh, and um, 
uh, and because of the, the Pontic identity that uh, became quite strong after the 60s and the 70s, and many, uh, Pauk had many very good Pontic players, and even, uh, oh, and also Thresh and player like Kudas. Uh, so uh, the, it's true that the, the, the identity of Pauk shifted uh, to um, changed and became more popular uh, and, uh, and, and more uh, actively, let's say, Pontic or, uh, um, or everything else. Uh, and a bit, um, we, 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 we are forgetting a bit about this Constantinopolitan history of Pauk uh, of the, the, the interwar period. Uh, so, uh, and it's true that uh, the Pontic identity is more linked with uh, a kind of uh, a popular uh, um, identity, a more um, uh, l l much less uh, elitistic uh, than the than Constantinopolitans. Um, so it's more in the 60s, 70s that this uh, changed. And also when Pauk, I need to, to, to explain that when Pauk um, became the, the, the team of whole uh, Central Macedonia. And that's because of the great team of Pauk in the beginning of the 70s. Okay. Um, Luca, a question on um, politics and violence. Um, what political involvement is with Pauk today? And is violence expected from the supporters of our football team? Yes. Uh, that's not a controversial question. No. Yeah, no, it's not a controversial <laughs> uh, question. Um, it's true that in, let's say, it's commonly said, I, I'm not, uh, I didn't do any research on Park in the 80s, or, but uh, the, the common tales are that Park in the 60s was the team of Eva, the Greek left, and then became the team of Pasok, because of course Pasok is was the in the eighties was like the major uh, popular uh, party of uh, the the countryside etc. Uh, and uh, now it's uh, it's kind of difficult to find a political uh, identity um, of Pauk because uh, um, even in the in the support uh, fans associations, uh, um, uh, you see that some associations are like far left, others are uh, right nationalists, uh, and they still um, coexist. I would say there were some moments of tensions inside uh, Pauk uh, fans uh, in, uh, in, in during the these last decades but it kind of stopped and there is more kind of ecumenical position uh, and uh, the the main uh, the main political uh, position of Pauk today would be against you know the the, the Athenian center that's the the main uh, political expression of Pauk I mean, like uh, uh, you know there, there is this dynamic of Thessaloniki that used to be this glorious metropolis that became uh, that lost its glory and its power and inside the Greek national state the northern Greece is marginalized so uh, Pauk is an expression of this uh, anti-Athenian uh, centralism you know uh, of, of this national uh, state uh, the Greek national state that concentrates everything in Athens. And it's very, it's kind of interesting because, you know, uh, I would say that Pauk uh, in the interval uh, and the, the Constantinopolitan officials of Pauk in the interval built in a certain way the, the nation, national state in Northern Greece. But by doing that, they marginalized themselves. Like they, they did the wrong bet, I would say, like by choosing the Saloniki as the, the the place where they would do the start the political career in the national frame but at the same time by by creating this national state in northern greece uh, you know the national state can only have one center right so they were losing its uh, this power to uh, the athenian center that 
reinforced itself. And and today, I would say that Pauk is this uh, uh, politically expresses this uh, uh, this um, how, how do you say pikra uh, 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 of uh, of being um, marginalized, uh, and that's what we see in during the every every time. Um, there are demonstrations, uh, uh, um, especially in January, for instance, when the Park was um, uh, afraid of, um, of being, um, uh, no, uh, there the, the, the was uh, losing points. Yes, yes, and even losing the the, the category and. The, Go to the second division. So, and it was seen as a plot of the center, the Athenian center against. You see the the contradiction of the northern team, um, and it's it. I mean, uh, it's I I could understand the, uh, this position, right? Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, Look, we have a, a question about. Um, political participation in the interwar period. Um, in the 20s and 30s, um, when you look at Thessaloniki's population, what percentage originated from Asia Minor? And was that percentage reflected um, in their political representation? Um, yes. I mean, especially sort of in the Venezuela in, in the Liberal Party, um, that let's say the number of candidates of Asia Minor background, was that also reflected on the percentage population in Thessaloniki. Yeah, uh, it's. Um, I, I told you that uh, the refugees that were settled in Thessaloniki were 117,000. So it's about, it's almost the half of the population of the city. Uh, so uh, some refugees became directly involved in politics, and these were the Constantinopolitans, and some Pontics, but Pontics that were a part of the Constantinopolitans, for instance. Um, so I don't know exactly uh, the statistics uh, inside the parties, but uh, I could identify, uh, as I told you, a uh, uh, trend. Um, Tendencies, how to say, trends inside the the parties, uh, like uh, lobbies of uh, of uh, refugees inside the Liberal Party that was quite strong, you know. Uh, um, as I told you, uh, in this clash between Pauk and Aris, Aris was reflecting more this uh, this local uh, Venzelist group uh, that um, perhaps became a minority after. Uh, after a while, yes. Uh, I didn't hear so well the last part of your question, I think. No, no, well, the percentage of the population, did that reflect uh, the percentage of political representatives um, in the parliament that had refugee background? It's, uh, uh, I, I should be, um, I, I should look again, but it's um, quite, yes, yes. Uh, uh, and uh, there is another thing that you need to uh, to remember that uh, the, the Jews of the Saloniki were not voting at the same uh, elections uh, uh, as the others of the, of the um, as the other population of the city. Uh, the Jews had their their own representatives uh, elected at the parliament, so um, uh, it made. That they had less uh, uh, elected um, members, in analogy uh, to the to to the, the the population that they were, and let's say perhaps uh, the refugees were not like fifty percent of the elected, but they were a large part of uh, of of uh, of uh, the the elected the representatives to. To the parliament, and uh, uh, at least during the the great Venizelist victories uh, of 1928, for instance, then the refugees are very strong, and they even create their own group at the parliament. Uh, 
groups of uh, elected uh, refugees uh, and there were a very strong lobby that was very disappointed in 1930 when Venizelos signed the agreement with, with uh, Turkey. Um, we've got a question from uh, Jorgo here. Um, and I don't know if you can answer this with your Park hats on, uh, Luca. Uh, it says, um, is Park, uh, is it a soccer team or is, is it a football team or is it a social movement? Uh, and, uh, and yeah, the, 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 I mean, the issue is trying to ra raise is that uh, the fact that the team is being, is marginalised um, and it does... Um, tries to block the concentration of power in Athens. And... Uh, you know, uh, the, the, the slogan le says, uh, Pauk Panapola is Pauk beyond everything. So uh, Pauk, Pauk uh, is, uh, uh, <laughs> of, of course, it, it's both and it's uh, beyond and it's, uh, um, it depends on the situation and the people and the, what the, the imagine it is. And, uh, but it's true that um, uh, the, 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 the imaginative world of Park is uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, very uh, big, <laughs> right? Uh, so, so sometimes people will say that Park is beyond the nations and the religions and uh, etc. So, um, Yes, uh, my re my re response is uh, quite dialectical. It's uh, at the same time uh, a team, uh, a social movement, uh, and everything else. <laughs> it's it's difficult difficult to pigeonhole. Um, just one question about the um, the Jews of the Saloniki. Um, no doubt they they had their own teams, but the question says here they took in terms of the teams they supported. They they more likely supported Addis and there was a Jewish president at one stage uh, rather than Heraklis or Pauk. What can uh, you about Jewish football support in the city? Yes, yes. Um, look, um, it's true that today there, there are some, uh, even today, even if the Jewish community, community quite doesn't exist, I mean, some hundred people in Thessaloniki perhaps are Jewish still. Um, still today, I, I remember in stadium slogans about the Jewishness of Aris. I remember this uh, as a child, for instance. And um, so I, I wanted to, uh, to, to find things about that. And it, and it appears that uh, when uh, Aris was founded in 1914, uh, so before the uh, before the first world war, uh, the Jewish community helped Aris to have uh, its first stadium, but uh, the Jewish community had its own team, Maccabi. But Maccabi Thessaloniki was representing, let's say, a certain uh, part, a certain part, uh, a political part of uh, of uh, the Jewish community. Um, yeah, Maccabi was also deeply politicized, let's say, uh, but uh, there were there were all the all the smaller teams of the Jewish community, of course. Uh, so the Jewish community had its own teams, but it's true that Aris and the Jewish community had quite good relationships. Let's let's say, um, I don't think Aris didn't have any uh, Jewish president, but um, during uh, one, one called Cohen, the speaker says this, there was a famous president by the name of Cohen, but yeah. I, I'm not sure of that. I need to verify, but I, I'm quite not sure. Uh, I, I've, I've never seen that in the records. Um, however, Aris uh, helped the Jewish community uh, during uh, the, um, the fire and it's especially after the pogrom when the, the offices of uh, Maccabi were destroyed. Uh, and Aris gave, I think, I remember at one point of, uh, of the, the interval, Aris gave, uh, gave like uh, training fields to Maccabi. I mean, there was, so uh, they had quite good relationship, but 
it, it, it doesn't mean that, uh, for instance, Park was always against the Jewish teams. That's, I mean, there are some moments of the interwar uh, when uh, there are some friendly matches, etc., friendly games. So uh, it's just at some points, let's say, of the political life when the tensions were high, that some uh, acts of violence of some parts of people that were linked to the clubs uh, that were active, let's say. Uh, but yes, it's true that Aris, as I see, had the best uh, relationship with the Jewish community. Uh, Iraklis not. I, I, I mean, uh, when Iraklis was founded as the first uh, Greek uh, team, uh, they had quite uh, in 1908. And uh, during these first periods, uh, uh, the relations between uh, Iraklis and uh, the Jewish community were quite complicated, I would say. So that's all I know. <laughs> um, so perhaps I would say, uh, uh, you know, inside the Jewish community, there were some uh, Jewish uh, political figures that were in favor of Venizelos. Uh, there were some um, representatives of the Jewish community that were in the Liberal Party. So perhaps these were making the link between, you know, these uh, moderate Venizelists of Aris and the the Jewish uh, liberals. Uh, uh, that's a, a hypothesis. Uh, Luca, um, thank you very much for your participation tonight. We'll bring the questions to a close because I think we, you can sort of continue until midnight. <laughs> um, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating topic and there's definitely more questions um, from the uh, participants. Uh, thank you everyone for participating. Uh, thank you, Luca, once again. Hopefully one day we'll have you in Australia uh, in the flesh in a post-COVID uh, Melbourne world um, and hope to see you all at next week's um, seminar on migrant ships to Australia. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, and um, uh, I hope everything goes well uh, for you in the next uh, uh, weeks. Uh, Lucas, Hello, just stay online.